Welcome to Women of Culture. I'm Meera T. Sundararajan. Join me and my distinguished guests to discover untold stories from the world of culture. When I was recently in Tokyo, I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Akira Maezawa, a brilliant engineer working at Yamaha on the development of AI systems. We met at the Grand Café of the Chinzanso Hotel in Tokyo, which is set in an enormous historic garden visited by Basho, the acknowledged master of haiku poetry who lived in 17th century Edo, as Tokyo was then known. I wanted to talk to Akira about Glenn Gould, the iconic Canadian pianist who made his last recording on a Yamaha piano in 1981, revisiting the Goldberg Variations of Bach, which he had originally recorded for his debut album in 1955. That album had made Gould an international music sensation, and it remains one of the best-selling classical albums of all time. When he re-recorded this work, Gould symbolically closed the circle of his life and work, a life spent in singular dedication to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, with whom he will always be indelibly associated as his premier modern interpreter. Gould died prematurely shortly after making this recording, at the age of 50. Glenn Gould was an artist like no other, Although his training, of course, was as a classical pianist, his artistic activities extended far beyond classical piano and even classical music. He wrote extensively on the topics that interested him, music, technology, and history, and he made extraordinarily entertaining programs on music for the CBC, while also trying his hand at radio documentaries, creating the experimental Idea of North documentary, and the more conventional, but no less interesting, biographical radio program on composer Arnold Schoenberg. Gould also played the works of Schoenberg and of other serialist composers from the early part of the 20th century with extraordinary insight, although no music could, at least on the surface, be more different from Bach. Perhaps most striking of all, was Gould's rejection of the traditional concert setting for music. Gould was deeply ambivalent about playing in front of an audience, retiring from public performance, and dedicating himself exclusively to recording at the young age of 32. This was an incredibly risky professional move, but the bet paid off, as he enjoyed a spectacular career as a recording artist without ever appearing in a concert hall after this time. Indeed, Gould was fascinated by technology, learning about the recording process and all of its technicalities to a very high standard, and he went so far as to argue that the concert hall as a setting for music performance and listening would become obsolete by the year 2000. He argued that listeners could have a much better experience at home, listening to recordings and being able to mediate their musical experiences through the technologies that brought music into the home in the first place, increasingly allowing listeners to moderate the way the music sounded through acoustic settings and equipment. Gould was an incredibly deep thinker, and his fascination with technology took his reflections into surprising areas, not only including the question of whether concert performance would become obsolete, but also, yet more radically, whether the concert artist would also disappear. The technological innovation that triggered this reflection was the Moog synthesizer, developed by Robert Moog in 1964 and used by Wendy Carlos in 1967 to record the album Switched on Bach, which featured musical works by Bach played by the synthesizer. Gould proclaimed that this 
was a remarkable musical achievement and a landmark in the interpretation of Bach. Was Gould being a provocateur? Probably, but this assessment must be considered in context. He seems to have been, above all, an educator at heart, wanting to raise the level of listeners to meet his own, wishing for his audiences to be better informed and to experience not only the joy of his artistry, but also the joy of learning. Provocation could serve this broader, ultimately ennobling goal. From a musical point of view, his statements about the Moog synthesizer are profoundly interesting. Was he really saying that a machine could best humans at that most human of all activities, music? September 25th, 2023 would have been Glenn Gould's 91st birthday. On this occasion, the Glenn Gould Foundation in Toronto held a special event on artificial intelligence at which they released a newly designed artificial intelligence system called Dear Glenn. Yamaha says that the project was inspired by his unique creative style and launched to explore the future of music through the use of artificial intelligence. Yamaha comments that Glenn Gould was known for his devotion to recording with digital media and an interest in rethinking the relationship between performer and audience. The project to develop the system has been dubbed Dear Glenn as a tribute to the artist's attitude, which was the inspiration for the idea behind the project. The work undertaken by the project is detailed by Yamaha as follows. Yamaha analyzed over 100 hours of Gould's performance recordings to develop an understanding of his playing style and employed deep learning algorithms based on the data collected to create the AI system. In addition to Gould's audio recordings, AI learning data included human input in the form of performances by multiple pianists who were admirers of Gould and intimately familiar with his performance style, raising the quality of reproduction to new levels. Near-instant performance analysis of fellow human players enables the AI to play predictively while interacting with human musicians. More than simply an automated performance, the AI reproduces the masterful touch of Glenn Gould to provide an inspiring and interactive experience of co-creation between an AI pianist and human musicians. Impressive, but is it authentic? When I learned about this project, I felt highly skeptical. As a friend of mine commented, is this dear in the sense of expensive? It's the marketing of a human being as a commodity. When I had the chance to talk to Dr. Mayazawa in Tokyo, I didn't hesitate to put my concerns forward. But I quickly learned something that made me feel differently. Akira-san himself is a musician. Our discussion was informed by his unmistakable love for music and his profound respect for Glenn Gould's artistry. Here, then, is Dr. Akira Mayazawa from Tokyo with his take on Dear Glenn, the AI based on Glenn Gould's inimitable piano playing, which Dr. Mayazawa has helped Yamaha to memorialize, for better or for worse, in a truly unprecedented way. So yeah, so you said that you were keeping track of legal developments in Japan as compared yes. to other places. Yeah, that already that's fascinating to me. So um, are you as a as a technologist interested in what's happening in the law? Do you see that as being relevant? Um, yeah, so I, I am interested because, you know, our my, my goal would be to deploy something for the, you know, uh, uh, no, customers or people to use. Yeah. So, you know, it's very interesting uh, for me because um, you know, it kind of you you know, one would have to think about some of these you know, legal ramifications. If there are legal ramifications, what can we do to make our you know, 
to be able to deliver our, you know, um, my research outputs to the customers. So it's a very practical problem for me. Absolutely. Is your sense that the legal community understands well the kinds of things that you're doing? Um, especially, uh, let me preface that by saying, like, your work is is particularly fascinating to me because, as you said, I'm I'm also a pianist and I've done a lot of work on Glenn Gould. In fact, I'm I'm actually writing a book on Glenn Gould. Oh. Um, and which is part of the reason I wanted to talk to you. And uh, it's so interesting to me how what you're doing, it's kind of on the nexus between the technological development and also the creative side. Mm -hmm. um, so you have several communities that you're interacting with you know, yeah. through your work. Um, so yeah, so from that perspective, you know, what, what do you think about uh, the legal? Um, so I think that you know even you know, so as I said you no know, I kind of go to conferences you know in music tech yeah. and even the researchers have very divided opinions um, depending on their stance or what they think about you know um, for example you know um, uh, how would I say so you know. Some people might say this is kind of you no know, setting a cap. You no, know, no, like the big corporations now have access to data. They have learned all the good models. Now they want to have restrictions so that other you no know, to stop competitors from you know, participating. Or you know, people might say, oh, you know, we want to have you new know, creativity and you know, expand the creativity possibilities. So even in technological community, it's I think you know there isn't any consensus, and I think you know we are still at kind of like a, trying to figure out what is good and what is not good in a way. And also in also in the artistic community as well, I see lots of people who want to you know easily incorporate these as kind of like an enabler or to you know explore new possibilities of creation. Whereas other people might be more reserved about you know the possibility of um, kind of having their creativity stolen. I think you know like I think the, there's a le you know, recent um, judgment in California regarding some lawsuits against Mid Journey. Oh yes, yes. Actually, the Mid Journey case was a copyright registration. Uh, so they try to register this work that is essentially incorporating elements generated through AI. Uh, you would know much better than me how that side of it works. Um, but basically she had images that were generated through AI and then text that they had written themselves. And so they tried to register the whole work and the copyright office said no. Uh, that the, you could only register the parts that had human input. Um, but that ended up being quite broad because not only the text but also the uh, overall compilation was deemed to be worthy of copyright protection. No, if there's a control input manipulated by humans, it's very difficult to identify like a boundary of what comprises you know, this human input, yeah. what comprises, because you know this you no know, a maybe in you know prior systems with you know, with rules that are clear cut is much easier, but with deep neural network like you know, these control inputs can propagate in very unexpected ways or things that can be foreseen, which is like the very great thing about you no, know, um, I think the generation text prompt. Know, propagates in you no know, unexpected ways to create the entire image, for example. Yeah. So it's I think I think in, 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 you know, I I kind of think think from technological side it would be very difficult as to find like a clear and non unambiguous way to define what constitutes creativity. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, I'm I'm comforted in a way to hear you say that because this is my sense as well is that we're kind of barking up some of the wrong trees in terms of trying to regulate this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the sense that I get is that in the artistic community, the, the stronger feeling right now is one of fear, as you say, about yes. having the creativity stolen or co-opted. Um, and also a lot of fear about being kind of replaced by, yes. by machines. Uh, which, again, I'd be curious to hear what you think. I mean, uh, my, my own sense is that's more of a of a question of ethics, actually, and mm -hmm. how we choose to approach this. And there isn't anything inevitable about technology taking over. Yes. So it's like a, this whole LC issue, you know, with like ethical, legal, and you know, societal issues, and these you know, regarding technology. It's like, um, and I, I, I think it's half about creating. You know, it's because you know, whenever there's new technology to develop a culture, there's always you know various forces um, involved. So I think yes, that, that kind of I do not know how ethical issues are resolved, but I think in general, from you know, my technological, you know, technological perspective, we will have to, you know, we really need to you know, respect 
the artists and people who actually create these contents. You know, it's I, I think you know um, these you know, going global project or you know maybe you know we have you know might have had very diff you know, different ramifications for implications. You know, if we didn't you know ask people who are you know um, actually you know. Um, had a you know, recording with uh, Glenn Gould, or maybe you know uh, experts in Glenn Gould, you know, to you know, kind of get give us feedback on what you know might have been useful. So this isn't anything ethical, but it's more like a personal personal you know, feeling kind of thing yeah. to have a, you know, to fe have a feeling that this is something that would, if you no know, he were alive, might have been something interested in. And I think you know, once you have that, you know, then we can, I think, have a, you know, that, that. That's probably one way to deliver. And another very wrong way would be, you know, we've scraped data from you know, <laughs> online and just you know, shuffled yeah. a deep, deep learning model and we are macho. You know, so I think that's no. So it's, yeah. <laughs> it, it's about you know, how to present and how to have mutual respect for different parties involved. At least I think that that's one way to start a mutual understanding and communication. Absolutely. Actually, as I'm listening to your talk, I'm thinking that people like you, who are very creative in the technology side, actually have a lot more in common with the artists than perhaps some of the corporate entities. Um, mm. You know, not to speak about Yamaha, but I'm thinking about some of the technological companies mm -hmm. and so on. Their outlook, Hollywood entertainment studios, their outlook tends to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, but I like what you're saying in terms of connecting with the creativity on both sides. That, mm. To me, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I want to ask you about mm -hmm. the Glenn Gould project in particular, because yes. I'm so curious. You said something very interesting, which is, uh, you know, trying to trying to understand what Glenn Gould himself might have thought mm -hmm. about doing something like this, which of course we can't do because he's not here. Mm -hmm. But he did leave, you know, so much writing and, and so much discussion that he did about technology, his enthusiasm as well. So, so can you tell me a little bit about how how this project developed, how? how you think about Glenn Gould's place in all of it, because he is at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, so I'd be kind of uncomfortable talking, you know, as a, like a podcast about how he might have thought, because this is kind of like, um, you know, you, you can't have like a straw man argument, you yeah. know. But, Absolutely. But I, I know, I think, you know, this, you know, this project develops as kind of like a, so I have been working on a way to model human performance to better understand, you know, performance. And to understand performance is through, you know, training a generative model. So I was, you know, feeding a music score and try to play the style of, you know, a human performance and see what the model has learned. It's a very nice way to, you know, kind of, um, well, it's, you know, it has you know, practical applications, but also it's kind of interesting because you know, the model, um, sometimes the you know, model creates very musically, you know, like, um, something that sounds very unnatural, but if you think about it musically, you can kind of find out why, you know, for example, maybe a system has overfit on like a phrase ending, or trying to slow down the phrase ending, for example, then you would kind of hear something, you know, for, um, I would say, for example, if you train a model that's been entirely trained on Chopin and the Mozart, then you would kind of sound as if Mozart has, you know, taken too much um, whiskey or something. Yes. <laughs> But you know, it kind of it, you know, has a very interesting learning experience. I think it's like experience, you know. So I, I kind of I more want to you know create things that understand human performance, you know, and do something useful for performance. So that was you know, very interesting. But so then I was working on this, um, and another you know, people, you know guys in marketing um, wanted you know they wanted to you know have to kind of like a deliver like a message about how AI and music should coexist. And we have been doing kind of like a brainstorming. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to say, you know, um, did this, you know, applying this technology might be something useful. And we were saying, you know, which you know, performer might be appropriate. Um, and, you know, um, and I think, you know, Glenn Gould came, came almost you know, unanimously. Mm -hmm. so, no, firstly, because he has experimented a lot with recording technology, which I think even today, you know, is some conservative pianists might find uncomfortable. Absolutely. Um, but I think you no, know, he has been exploring, exploring new creativity. It's almost like a DJ yeah. and you know, um, pianist. Um, you no, know, he has been. I you know from what I think, and you know, I believe you know, he has been quite influenced by you know, kind of like a McLuhan's you no know, media theories. Yes. You know, and I think you know, it, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, making these you know, media of communication one level more abstract through AI because you know, AI is still like a compressed model. It's just you know, communicating different you know, via different channels. So I think you know, this implication I thought was quite interesting. Mm. Um, and you know, 
Also, Glenn Gould has a rather distinct musical playing style, so it's very, you know, from technical development aspect, it's, you know, very good. Um, it's an very good to decide, you know, and, you know um, it's easy to assess if the model is learning a style, his style or not. Um, and fourth, you know, um, you know he, he played on our you know, CF piano you know, in uh, his you know, later uh, career, so that was, you know, had you no know, struck with the you know, Yamaha side. Yeah, the famous, the last Goldberg Variations mm -hmm. recording, of course, was done on Yamaha. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very well. Absolutely. So it's so interesting. I'm just I'm listening to you. I'm just finding it so uh, fascinating. There was one aspect of the uh, uh, Dear Glenn that I was especially curious about uh, mm -hmm. when I was reading about it. It said that one of the things you were interested in was having it play music that Glenn Gould had not played mm -hmm. during his lifetime. So that was fascinating. Why did you make that choice? Well, I, it's, um, um, I think it's more, um, I think, you know, having you know, these machinely learned human patterns would be, um, you know, it would be interesting, you know, to, to create something that, you know, for, for you know, the next generation of music, you know, musicians and you know, music pieces that, you know, um, that came up after, you know, um, his death. Um, so, you know, that's, that's really interesting. And actually, so my initial idea is, so, you know, I'm kind of work to kind of backtrack a bit more. So I've been working on this thing called um, music, you know, ensemble, automatic ensemble system. Which you know, I actually am. I play violin. Okay. So you know, when I play the violin, I you know, have a accompaniment system that I play piano, for example, with me. Yes. So you know, maybe you know, at home I can play like a Brahms violin sonata or something. You know, have a piano accompany me. And I always always had this you know, dissatisfaction you know, I, about you know, these you know, creating you know, the music that you know, when I play with a very you know, musical accompanist. The accompaniment gives you lots of musical ideas and insights. It's not just having something that simply tracks you. And I was you know, trying to see what, you know, if I can create you know, these musical insights you know, that you know, can you know, provide you know, this you know, system that can also provide me with musical insights, you know, which kind of got me interested into expressive modeling and you know, how you know, expression kind of, you know, how you, you can interact. You know. So, so basically, I you know, wanted to basically make a system so that I can I'll be able to play like you know, um, no, uh, maybe Beethoven, by uh, Sonata with AI. That's fantastic! <laughs> yes, amazing. I, actually, I can really relate to what you're saying as well because um, I'm I'm also a singer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I sing jazz uh, in, in addition to being a classical pianist. So I don't play jazz, and I would sing a lot more if I had a nice accompaniment that mm -hmm. I could you know, literally turn on and practice different improvisations and so on. So, um, you know, there are these, uh, uh, I don't know what they're called, but they're apps that allow you to play, um, you know, the, the structure of a jazz song. Yes. It'll give you the harmonic changes. It's extremely unsophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, so imagine, you know, something like you're describing, that would be absolutely amazing. So as a musician, I can completely relate to what you're saying. Um, or, if, or for a pianist, even being able to play with an orchestral background and practice yeah. your concerto, I mean, these kinds of things would be amazing. Um, so, do you think that you achieved that with this technology, or is not it at all? It's long. There is a long way to go. It's so, long way to go. Like, well, for, for, I mean, for, first of all, um, there, there are many aspects. One being that if you train, like you know, humans play differently in a solo versus you know, in solo versus ensemble. So, in our you know, first premiere in Ars Electronica. We also had like, like a Glenn Gould play, you know, this in you know, a system play the pieces he has never played as a solo, and also do chamber music. What turned out that you know, during rehearsal is you know, play chamber music like a piano trio and a piano duet with a Franche from a Francesco Tristano and you know, this you know, AI. Although, um, and what we found is that you know, if you play piano duet or something and it's all do 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 it's it, it doesn't really. You know, <laughs> um, Stand. No, you can't yeah. really play with that kind of yeah. um, data, even if you know, there's an adaptive mechanism to adapt to tempo or something. So, and then that also kind of raises a whole new philosophical 
you know, the Strawman argument of how, you know, would Glenn Gould have acceded to the other pianists or would have, you know, have, have, you know, have gone this way? So that's you know, kind of like another you know, unanswered question. Yeah, I think that question is really difficult because the whole point of chamber music is the dialogue amongst the different、uh, performers, and that does strike me as being, I won't say uniquely human, but it strikes me as being essentially human、mm -hmm. because the whole point of the chamber interaction is that the musicians talk to each other through music and respond to each other. So、um, even that issue of, like, you know, Glenn Gould, would he have done it his way as opposed to, let's say, Yegrim and Hint's way? I mean, They have to have common terms on which they're having the, the dialogue, even if one performer takes the lead.、Mm -hmm. um, so, but from your point of view, I, I think I can see also if the technology were sophisticated enough, then it would integrate a degree of this responsiveness to what's happening in the environment,、yeah. which is just an amazing prospect.、Um, and I think very exciting when we consider the AI as a creative tool or creative、mm -hmm. partner.、Um, we don't talk enough about these things. You know, what I hear about、um, both. More, more on the legal side、uh, mm -hmm. than anything else is the prospect of AI replacing musicians,、mm -hmm. um, which is not what you're talking about at all.、Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, usually, you know, I think, you know, when we, you know, researchers do research, you know, people, you know, I think, you know, music, te music technology isn't, you know, doesn't usually have to bring in that much money. So people who do music technology research are people who genuinely love music.、Yeah. But I think, you know, th there's always this, you know, corporate dynamism that、yeah. kind of wants to, you know, um, um, no, um, and there's always this kind of thing. So I, I can definitely see why people might have these kind of reservations or concerns. Um, so, I mean, I think, but one common thing might be, you know, it may be, you know, it's so, you know, maybe like a regulation, but, you know, kind of to try to find a way so that, you know, musicians can actually, you know, benefit from these, you know, kind of you know, mechanisms so that it's not like one company, the provider of the AI that's kind of free riding on everything. And I think that might be, some, I think that's like one important you know, aspect, you know. Um, that might not like can be controlled legally. But, no, I think you know, even but you know, and、uh, and kind of, I would just want to make one you know, I think thing that might be interesting is that I think. Even with creativity, as you know, I, my, my, no, I learned, you know, I trained this model. I think, you know, with, you know if I train a more,、um, if I had you know, humongous data, I can maybe train more sophisticated models. So there are still some data limitations. But what I found is that, you know, it's very AI by definition learns kind of like a meta average. So everything would kind of revert towards the mean.、Um, and I think, you know, I'm not sure how to, I you know.、Um, One question I'm having is Is creativity described by like a mean, an average, or is it like a deviation from there? Because I've noticed that, you know, for example, in like a Glingle's report, you know, so the system learns kind of like a mannerism, like, you know, oh, he might have kind of, you know, tends to have short articulation or you know, have like a kind of like a slur at the first two bases or something, you know, or emphasize the inner voices more than other. So these kind of, but it's kind of like a more average, I guess, you know,、um, description of Glingle. But I think you know. But, but I think what makes his you know,、uh, performance important is very special. I think is some of the moments where you know, it seems to seem like you know, he punches you in the face or something, you know, <laughs> or, not, or in your you know, brain or something. You know, and there are these few absolutely memorable moments I think you know, in his recordings that signify him. It's not the touch, I think, but it's what you know, these exceptions and. I'm wondering if that can be acquired through machine learning by learning some kind of average. You know, is it like something that's acquired, or is there no need for some other model of creative process? So that's more kind of like a you know, machine learning or you know, things. But you know, I, I think there's kind of like a way for you know, creativity, you know,、um, for you know, humans in, you know, to, you know, I think that that that. That kind of you know, special moments are what I think humans should you know, would kind of focus more on creativity, and I think you know, AI should. You know, and it's, maybe AI can support some of the low level, I think, you know, the mannerisms, I guess.、Hmm. Yeah, I, I so much appreciate what you're saying because one of the questions that I often hear asked is 
what's special about human creativity, what can humans do that machines can't do? And this question always makes me a bit uncomfortable because I'm not sure that can be articulated in words, but I think you just did express it in words very well. Uh, you know, because Glenn Gould is not, for example, the sum of his mannerisms or his style. Mm. There's, uh, those, are, those are more cosmetic. It's more how he chooses to deploy them. It's his will, it's his intention, it's his mm. vision as an artist that brings those tools into play and he deploys them in a certain way. Um, as, you, as you explain it with your expertise, the machine is not set up to do that. It's set up to do something a little bit different. And the way you describe it, again, it makes so much sense to me. I see a lot of complementarity between the functions of the music and the functions of the musician. And I understand something I've been wondering about for a long time, which is, uh, is AI a tool that can be used by creative people? Is it a good tool? And from your explanation, it seems like, yes, there's a lot of potential. Yes, I think it's kind of like... I think the best use case would be kind of like an enabler for creative people. Absolutely. So, you know, like maybe, you know, I, I can definitely say like, you know, I, I'm interested in piano, playing the piano, but I haven't you know, spent my lifetime you know, um, playing pianos, I know. But I want to express something, you know. You know so, and so I can maybe have some kind of you know, uh, like a high level control of what I, you know, how, I would, how I would want to play. And maybe the execution, the actual execution might be offloaded to the machine. Or you know, some, 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 these kind of ways, so that you know, uh, and I think you know that's how maybe you know, for example, you know, like uh, LMs like ChatGPTs are used nowadays. You know, they have like a, some you know, overall idea, and the actual sentence or you know, whatever task is you know, delegated to the machine. I think that's a very nice way to that can be definitely be applied to the machine. Um, I mean, uh, one thing I do see is that you know. You know, um, time in you know, history shows that if there are things that can be common, you know, described common by a technology, you no know, technology would you know, sometimes you no know, replace you no know, human. So I mean, you, know, you would you, know, you would hear these recordings. You know, yeah. maybe you know, like a, a century ago, you would, might have had you know, the pianist to play. Yeah. So you know, that, that, but I think that's kind of like a, more of a social dynamics. I, I do kind, of, I do understand people you know, who have been doing this kind of as occupation would have reservations about mm -hmm. the new, you know, for example, you know, records. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think that then that that's also another whole thing, you no know, issue that I think has lots of unanswered questions, which I do not really have any answers yeah. for. I think those are really big questions, and you're you're totally right. I mean, looking back in the history of music, let's say a hundred years ago, you know, pianos were very important at that point in European countries and in, in many other places in the world because that was how you got music, you know, in public settings and community settings. So, like you said, we would be sitting here, there'd be a piano here, somebody would be playing, and over the 20th century, with recording, you know, that more or less disappeared, and now uh, the piano itself, there's less demand for it as an instrument. Um, I mean, just like in terms of numbers of pianos that you could buy and sell, produce and sell and so on. Um, and then of course in these public settings we have the opportunity for recording music. So, um, yeah, I'm often struck, uh, Vienna is one place that I've traveled from time to time where you may have been and you go into cafes and there is someone sitting there and playing the piano. And to me, it's the only place in the world that I know where that's still happening. Um, so, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right, you know, with the technology there's always a, an evolution that's happening at the broader level of society. We can't necessarily predict because we're caught up in it. It was wonderful to have this opportunity to learn from Dr. Mayazawa about the science and philosophy behind AI and music, and about Dear Glenn in particular. Fascinating as I find all of this, however, I can't shake my doubts. I find myself thinking about Glenn Gould and who he was as an artist. His passion for technology is well known and undeniable. At the same time, however, he was a profoundly exacting and perfectionist recording artist who could spend hours crafting a few moments of sound on tape. He extolled what he called the new listener, who would use technological means to personalize the recordings that he was listening to. 
Yet he invested so much care in the creation of his own recordings that there can be little doubt about his desire to communicate his own definitive artistic vision to the public. There's something paradoxical about this, but artists don't have to be consistent. They have something greater than consistency to offer to the public in the form of their creativity. And this is where Dear Glenn worries me. Quite apart from the obvious commercial aspect of the invention, duly noted by Dr. Mayazawa, this system is supposed to play music in the style of Glenn Gould. It is even able to play music that Glenn Gould did not play during his lifetime in his style. But what exactly does that mean? There was music that Gould disliked, including Mozart. Will AI play it in his stead now? Will the public continue to know about Gould's likes and dislikes, why he valued certain music, and what he had to say about his musical preferences? When these recordings are shared with the public, will they join the unstoppable stream of information currently enveloping our planet? And will we still be able to distinguish between recordings actually made by Gould and those made by the AI? Doesn't it matter that this could present a clear threat to the entirety of Gould's legacy of recorded music, which is already under threat on various fronts? Indeed, the same could be said about re-performances of works by the system with which Gould was closely associated. The risk of confusion seems real and potentially serious. This is why I have chosen not to feature any sound from Dear Glenn in this program, using Glenn Gould's own recordings exclusively instead. There's something else to consider, too. Glenn Gould's piano playing and his interpretation of various composers, including Bach, can be incredibly idiosyncratic. But those idiosyncrasies strike me as being very superficial manifestations of Gould's artistry, perhaps the result of a process that he went through to approach his ideal of musical interpretation and his vision. His goal seems to have been something even greater than the ideal of presenting a composer's work well. When it came to Bach, his endeavor seems to have been mystical as well as musical. Many people who listen to Gould today feel that he is so closely identified with the composer that there is almost a merging of identities between them. Dear Glenn can reproduce the idiosyncrasies of how Glenn Gould played the piano. But can it reproduce the essence of his creativity beyond these superficial manifestations of it, his vision of the music? Can it reproduce the mystical connection between him and Bach? The idea that there is something predictable about creativity, that this is how Glenn Gould might have sounded if he had played X composer, seems facile. Because every note Gould played, like every other musical artist of stature, reflected his creative choices. The key word, I believe, is creative. His artistry reflected his self-determination as an artist and as a creative being. Playing was a human act, one to which he brought his idiosyncrasies, his particular character and background, his training, his weaknesses and shortcomings, whatever they may have been, the totality of himself. This is what he gave to the public. I believe this is why so many people today not only admire Glenn Gould, but also love him. No artificial intelligence technology, no one and nothing but the artist himself can give such a supreme gift to his fellow human beings.